Welcome to BJUI International's uh, podcast. And today I have the privilege of interviewing Jeffrey Weiss, who's the author of the recent uh, major review published in the BJUI on Nocturia. My name is Marcus Drake. I'm the editor of the BJUI website. And uh, Jeff is a person that I've worked with previously on Nocturia initiatives. He is substantial stat stature in the field of Nocturia and I'm extremely pleased to have the opportunity to interview him. I have to explain though that we are currently, or at least he is, in the midst of Hurricane Irene. So if there is any problems with the recording we have to blame forces of nature other than Jeff himself. So if it's all right Jeff can I please get you to uh, uh, introduce yourself and perhaps describe your current clinical and academic role. Thanks very much, Marcus. I'd be delighted to. Uh, I'm, of course, uh, Jeffrey Weiss. I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Urology at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I have a residency program, which I am the director of, with 12 uh, residents. We have a, a five-year residency commencing with uh, a year of general surgery and four years of urology and uh, seven affiliates, so it's uh, quite a, uh, a busy array of, uh, of hospitals to keep track of. Uh, I also have a, a full-time full practice at a federal hospital in uh, New York City called the New York Harbor Healthcare System, which is dedicated to the care of uh, veterans of the U.S. military services. It's a remarkable responsibility you have, and I'd be interested to know uh, what training you went through and uh, how you've ended up in, in this prominent position? Well, the training uh, was at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, after finishing medical school at the University of Pittsburgh, I did three years of general surgery at Penn and then three years of urology. I then went into private practice in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I was full-time in private practice for 24 years. But during the mid time, I did something unusual. Uh, about 11 years into my practice, I did a fellowship in neurodynamics with Dr. Jerry Blavin, and that led to a part-time academic practice in New York City for about 10 years, during which time uh, I began at uh, the post of clinical assistant professor of urology at Weill Cornell and then uh, was promoted to clinical associate professor and following that time uh, I achieved a relationship with the doctors at SUNY Downstate Medical Center which happens to be a place right near the place of my birth. Uh, I was offered the position of full professor and then circumstances eventually led me to become first the associate program director uh, followed by becoming the full-time program director and then finally about a year and a half ago, uh, a search for a new chairman uh, was carried out and the dean of Downstate Medical College was uh, Dr. Ian L. Taylor, who interestingly is, uh, was brought up in Liverpool, England. And uh, he selected me as chairman, so I've been the clinical chair of the department for a year and a half. And I'm the only full-time employee of the U.S. Veterans Administration who is a clinical chair at the Downstate Medical Center. Well, with such a remarkable training, you've obviously had the potential to, to go into various aspects of urology. So what's prompted your interest specifically in Nocturia? When I was doing my fellowship with Dr. Blavis, that was a time when there was an initial interest in Nocturia. And Nocturia previously had pretty much been something that most people, even physicians, would have associated with BPH. And if, if someone had, be, had nocturia, the chances are that that person was a man and that that man would respond to about the only therapy that we had, which was the transurethral resection of the prostate. So there was a transfer of the recognition that nocturia was similar to internal enuresis and perhaps was really not so much a surgical problem, but an expression of a problem with the handling of water by the body in general and by the 
cardiovascular renal systems in particular. So we did some research and looked at our own patients and found that, in fact, nocturnal urine overproduction was a very important cause for nocturia. And the question was, could you treat nocturia with something like an antidiuretic taking uh, the lead from the treatment of nocturnal enuresis? There's been a great deal of work on that score, uh, and some of it has been militated by pharma industry, as, as, as is the case with much of what we know about uh, avoiding dysfunction in general. But in any case, a great deal of independent research has been looked at uh, in order to determine the causes of nocturia, epidemiology of nocturia, risk factors, economic costs, and of course, the $64 question, how do we treat it and what really works? So overall, this has been a fundamental shift away from regarding nocturia as a lower urinary tract symptom to a symptom not even just of the urinary tract, but the entire organism, endocrine dysfunction, uh, autonomic dysfunction, and so much, a fundamental shift. That's true. In fact, I really think, of course, everybody thinks that their disease is the most interesting. But when, when you really sit down and take a complaint of nocturia seriously and evaluate it properly with the usual history, physical, urinalysis, flow, residual, question, and diaries, we come to something like 17 or 18 very interesting and very significant medical diagnoses. We can really categorize nocturia into nocturnal urine overproduction, which unlocks a gamut of differential diagnoses, which include congestive heart failure, di untreated diabetes mellitus, sleep apnea, peripheral edema, which can be, for example, venous disease, or just behavioral problems such as excessive nighttime fluid intake, uh, low bladder capacity, which really we, I still tend to think of as a urological problem, example, like obstruction, stones, infection, pharmacologic agents such as beta blockers or diuretic taken at the hours of sleep. And finally, uh, polyuria, which is my favorite subject, which is global 24-hour overproduction of urine, which can be due, again, to untreated diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, which can be central or peripheral, can be induced by various drugs, such as uh, tetracyclines or lithium, affecting the action of antidiuretic hormone on the nephro, or behavioral, such as uh, primary polydipsia. So when you add up all the medical conditions and causes of nocturia when you break it up into those categories of nocturnal polyuria, low, bladder, low nocturnal bladder or global capacity, and global polyuria, you come up with at least 17 medical diagnoses, and that really spawns a great deal of understanding of what is going on with the patient, all from a simple complaint of nocturia. So the degree to which you're going to learn about the patient and be able to treat the patient in a more profound manner it really is much related to how much time you're willing to spend going into this condition and investigating it with these very simple and really non-invasive techniques. Notice I didn't mention cystoscopy or urodynamics or biopsies or, or surgeries. Well, I'm going to try and put the cat amongst the pigeons, as we term it in England, Raise, raise the controversy of the fact that uh, people uh, almost always refer to urologists and urologists uh, on the whole have a very decisive attitude to life and would like to operate. And quite often people proceed to TURP having described nocturia uh, from the patients. And yet the interesting thing is from what you've just described, you really would not expect TURP to have a good outcome for pretty much any of these conditions except a, a small minority of patients. And yet there are reports that describe good outcome for nocturia with TURP. How do you react to, to these publications that claim this? Well, first of all, men are only half the population. So we've got 
the nocturia is an equally prevalent condition in women. So right away, that limits the applicability of TURP. I think if, if a man is obstructed and if the symptoms are both daytime and nighttime, then I can expect a considerable improvement in the nocturia to result from a properly done outlet reducing procedure. So I think if you look at the data, uh, there is a study done in 2003 in Japan and of all the symptoms listed on the AUA symptom score sheet, the International Prostate Symptom Score sheet, nocturia fared the least well in terms of improvement of all of those lower urinary tract symptoms. However, nocturia actually did improve by about one time, which is as good as any pharmacologic therapy or probably even better has ever been demonstrated. So it's not such a bad treatment. It's just that the, the outcome of a transurethral section in the appropriate patient is so good and so durable that the nocturia, which is indeed multifactorial, fares less well than the improvement in the other related symptoms, but still fairly well and better than most of the other treatments that have ever been devised, even some that are experimental at the present time. And, and which have hopefully a bright future. But I would not put down a TURP as a poor treatment for nocturia, particularly in men who have global symptoms. Now, if a man simply has nocturia and no other symptoms, and particularly if that man does not have obstruction, a TURP is probably doomed to failure in terms of its effect on nocturia. And with its potential side effects, of course, that should really be discouraged. Now that's very interesting and leads us on nicely to the uh, publication recently in the BJUI, the Consensus Statement. Now this is a very important initiative and, and one of the areas that, that's helping us to make some progress now is, is the real eleva elevation of this symptom into a key discussion point supported by consensus initiatives. So perhaps you could uh, set the background as to this particular initiative. Well, we wanted to get together a, a panel of experts to make a consensus statement evaluation and treatment of nocturia. So we had an array of uh, well-known urologists, a geriatrician, uh, sleep specialists, uh, people who are uh, expert on uh, epidemiology. Uh, we had people who have published on the outcomes of transurethral prostate resection, on the use of complementary and alternative medical uh, people who have done research on uh, antidiuretic therapy in nocturia. Uh, we got all these people into a conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I believe it was in April of 2010 and uh, had a day-long discussion of uh, <clears throat> the epidemiology of nocturia, the risk factors, um, the economic impact, and uh, the manifold methods which have been proposed to treat nocturia and came up with uh, an evaluation of what seems to work and, and what the areas for future uh, investigation in nocturia might be. And we summarized this in a, an article which uh, the BJUI was kind enough to publish for us. So, Jeff, what do you perceive to be the main messages from this major consensus review? The main message is, is that nocturia is a very common, both in women, is multifactorial, and an evaluation of nocturia will unlock uh, a very large array of potential underlying conditions. Uh, generally, bladder storage problems, urine overproduction or nocturnal polyuria, global 24-hour <clears throat> polyuria, primary sleep disorders, uh, and other medical factors, including uh, cardiac issues, neurologic issues, uh, uh, and the use of uh, various patients. We found that uh, nocturia is costly to society. Uh, and that uh, nocturia seems to be related to oral bladder, but 
treatment of overactive bladder has had disappointing outcomes on uh, the the, uh, the outcomes of benefits or lack thereof of nocturia. <clears throat> uh, we looked at uh, alpha blockers and medications for the prostate. We looked at nutraceuticals. We found that outcomes are not particularly impressive. Uh, we looked at the outcomes of therapy of nocturnal polyuria when related to uh, sleep apnea, which seems to be more encouraging. Uh, some encouragement in the area of antidiuretic therapy in treating nocturia, but what we have not determined are exactly who the best candidates for all of these various treatments are. So we, we looked at the idea that there, there's a need for future research, such as uh, just simply uh, who has nocturia? Should we relate bother to nocturia, or should we keep the very simple and basic uh, definition of nocturia as elaborated by the Standard Committee of the International Society? Uh, our discussion needs to be done on this regard. Uh, certainly, we think the relationship between a primary sleep disorder and nocturia needs to be studied. We assume that nocturia is deleterious because of its effect on sleep. We think that nocturia, in fact, could have an effect on um, mortality, and so additional epidemiologic research would be done in regard. We would like to know what really seems to work and for what patients. And that really is the most important question that was raised, is what are the best treatments available and who has patients to receive each treatment? And in view of the multifactorial nature of nocturia, is it unrealistic to think that monotherapy is going to be effective in individuals, or is the treatment of nocturia usually going to be multifactorial and interdisciplinary? And that's a key point, isn't it? Because uh, the referral to the urologist that is so naturally um, inevitable almost from the primary care physicians, does the urologist represent the best person to take on these patients' management? <clears throat> yeah, I, I can definitely give you my very biased opinion on that, and I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think that urologists have all of the tools to take care of the problems that patients with nocturia have. And we need to be emphasizing the non-urologic cause for nocturia. And I think the non-urologic causes or the so-called medical causes are still within the purview of urologists. But then when you add to that the urological causes, which are very important, we have an overview that really the urologist is uniquely positioned to identify and treat. And having said that, there have been times that we want to engage the services of nephrologists, general internists, neurologists, geriatricians, cardiologists, even sleep specialists, pulmonary internists, and, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and I often do engage those individuals. And I think all of those, those individuals and those disciplines think that nocturia is interesting but I think they're way behind in actually evaluating and treating nocturia patients. So without a doubt in my mind, urologists, which have an excellent combination of both medical and surgical skills and evaluations for all of these conditions, are uniquely situated to be the, quote, captains of the ship when it comes to evaluating and treating patients with nocturia. And I, I agree with you, though... I would emphasize that we need to ensure that the profession of urology has the open mind to recognize that there are so many different causes for nocturia that um, they need to consider. So they need to really have an interest in the area in order to achieve a good outcome. That's true. And, you know, when, when we were first working on nocturia, even, let's say, 12 13 years ago, it was obvious that if we're going to have this new paradigm for understanding nocturia, that it was going to be an enormous effort to educate 
people worldwide on this subject. So we've had a lot of effort. We've, most of the international meetings, ICS, the EAU, the AUA, there have been symposia. Uh, the geriatric societies have now been emphasizing nocturia. A lot of national symposia, very well attended, but it's a big world, uh, and it's a, an uphill battle to think that we're going to educate all the practitioners in the world. Uh, just when we great because we came out of a meeting that was attended by 125 people, uh, we realized how many tens of thousands of not just doctors but urologists there are worldwide, and then add on top of that the you know, urology is actually a very small specialty. It's one of the smallest. There's all those internists and gynecologists and uh, uh, geriatricians who are out there taking care of all these people, and everybody's busy. So it's very difficult to get people globally to have an interest in this. So I think uh, education uh, is, is a paramount uh, need in, uh, in improving care of patients with nocturia. Uh, the review article in BJUI, I think, will uh, be widely read. It's a, it's a really, I think, if I might say so, it's a beautiful article. And something like this and others like it uh, will help in the education of physicians globally. Key message. And um, as we conclude, can I ask you one last question, which is what do you see for the future in terms of research priorities? what works. Uh, I think, for example, uh, there, there's a tremendous use of overactive bladder medications in treating nocturia, and yet the data really doesn't support it. However, uh, the studies have not been powered to look at the results of anti-muscarinic therapy or overactive bladder medications uh, in patients with nocturnal urgency, because after all, overactive bladder is characterized primarily by urgency. Uh, I think that there is ongoing investigation on this, and we may yet find out that we can identify a subpopulation of patients with overactive bladder who, in fact, will benefit from antimonorinics. In terms of treatment of the prostate, uh, alpha blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors have not panned out very well. Again, I think patient selection is key. I, I do think that in men with outlet obstruction, who also have nocturia, we probably will find that nocturia is well treated in those selected patients. Um, Anti-diuretic therapy is a very hot topic right now. There's a lot of research on uh, several anti-diuretics. Uh, anti-diuretic therapy is approved in about 60 countries worldwide, uh, not in the United States, and as far as I know, not in the United Kingdom. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. But I think that there is a great deal of optimism that antidiuretic therapy is a, a generally an effective and safe approach, but has always been hampered by fears of hyponatremia, which is the one uh, known side effect of antidiuretic therapy, and yet it's a very serious potential side effect. So the identification of how to treat patients with nocturia with antidiuretics in a manner that would keep them safe uh, is one of the key qualities of intense. I should have a considerable um, uh, amount of information forthcoming perhaps over the next year or so in that regard. Uh, we still haven't done enough research on the behavioral therapy. Uh, the use of simple maneuvers such as fluid restriction, whether it has to be just for the four or five hours prior to sleep or whether it has to be globally. Um, the, the use of stockings. We talk about stockings, but we really have very little in the way of outcomes. We have a number of studies which are very poorly designed that mix a number of behavioral therapies such as restriction of fluids, having a warm bed, um, restriction of salt and the stockings, and we jumble them all up and find that they seem to work somewhat, but we really haven't studied all of these individual treatments, and we, we're constantly talking to patients about these simple, quote, lifestyle maneuvers, and yet 
have not actually done controlled studies. So the study designs to investigate these very important, simple, and safe maneuvers in Arcturia are really not there. And I will greatly look forward to somebody taking those on. Much of the research is fueled by pharma because these are expensive and longitudinal studies, and uh, it's very difficult to get grant money. So that's one of our problems is that studying uh, treatments which do not have a great remunerative uh, uh, return uh, seem to be very difficult to come by. So outcomes is paramount. I think we know a lot about the risk factors in epidemiology and economic costs of nocturia. I think we have a good way to evaluate nocturia. Um, we really would like to have some algorithms in terms of exactly how to screen for nocturia, uh, whether we need to use diaries in all patients or we can uh, just uh, use a simpler uh, historical maneuvers. Uh, we do want to engage the talents of all of these subspecialists, such as geriatricians, cardiologists, sleep specialists, in particular nephrologists, endocrinologists, and have teams uh, with with urologists to try to determine the answer to these very important questions. Well, truly a daunting but fundamentally important prospect. So it it's, remains my privilege to thank you on behalf of the BJUI International for the conversation that we've just had and also for the excellent review article, which I hope the readers will really take the trouble to assimilate. So, Professor Jeffrey Weiss, my thanks to you. My pleasure, Professor Drake, and, and my thanks to you as well.